So I have a, a long and varied history in the world of Linux certification. I used to work for a company called Zare many, many, many years ago, which was a competitor to the LPI. LPI was a nonprofit organization. We were a nonprofit organization as well, but not by design. <laughs> <laughs> we might as well have been one. Uh, but Linux certification has really come a long way in that the market has, has expanded, contracted, expanded, contracted. So if you're not familiar with what has been going on since roughly 2010, uh, I'll acquaint you with the history of Linux Plus and you know, the various you know, LPI and things like that. Having worked for LPI, having worked for SUSE, and now having just written the latest version of the Linux Plus book for Pearson, I find myself with the weird conjunction of knowing a lot about all of them. So I'll be happy to answer questions, but I wanted to kind of work you through what you can expect uh, as far as this certification goes, why it might be something that you might want to add to your, to your uh, quiver of arrows of certifications, uh, and also a reason why you might want to do that. So um, uh, how many of you are, are a hiring manager or have been involved in the hiring process? Okay, so let me acquaint you very briefly with the hiring process, and that is, is that these days, well, sometimes, it depends on one, the, what the job is, but you'll get a lot of resumes, you get a lot of people. And one of the problems with getting a lot of resumes and a lot of people is, you know, today's hiring process is typically somebody, a recruiter, is going to be scouring and getting all these things and then compiling them for you and in some meaningful way. And oftentimes it means that they'll, put the, they'll, they'll assign point values and rank order and all that. And only a certain set of people who have the higher number of points based upon the different criteria that they have will actually get the interview. And so <clears throat> I've seen very qualified people who weren't perhaps quite as thoughtful about what they put on their resume or claiming things that they ought to have actually not get an interview and they would have been awesome in the job. Or somebody looked at, at what they had and said, well, I don't know if they've got the experience. Okay. So one of the things I like to do in this sort of thing is not just help you figure out if you want to get the certification, but maybe kind of help you see that some of, there's some things out there that can be done that will help you get into the interview. Now for me, it's all about the interview, because once you get into the interview, you can impress them with how wonderful you are and what a great cultural fit you'll make and how diligent you are and that you'll work all night and all day, uh, you know, but yet have a work-life balance and all that, right? <laughs> Anybody ever been asked that question, so can you tell me what your greatest weakness is? Isn't that like the worst question in the world? I no longer answer with what I used to, which was, well, I like to smoke crack on the weekends. <laughs> Somebody didn't laugh one time, and I was like, oops. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Felt a little defensive the rest of the interview. <clears throat> All right, so one of the things that I do want to do is acquaint you with what we're going to be talking about. So quick history of Linux Plus so you understand what happened and why this is actually exists the way it is, and why did they actually accept to talk about a Linux certification that's been around since the mid-90s. Not in this form, it hasn't, so that's one of the things. What's new in it, and then a quick objectives review. Now, I've been leaving lots of room for questions and just, you know, I, you know the things that you might look at the, at the objectives and think to yourself, <laughs> why is that on there? It's okay, it's occurred to the rest of us as well. So there are some interesting design choices that um, uh, I'm, I can come up with a reason why they would put it on there, but I can't come up with a resounding reason why they would put it on there. But you have to know this stuff. The other thing is, is that when you look at a set of objectives, and there's lots and lots and lots of commands and files and things like that, it's good to look at the percentages of the different domains. So a domain in this world means domain one would have to do with maybe installation and configuration. Domain two would be with system administration. Domain three would be security. Domain four would be whatever, okay? So a domain just means an area. And so this one has four domains, hardware and system, systems operation, security, and then troubleshooting. All right, so let's take a look really quickly at what happened. Many years ago, I've been a trainer for about 25 years. And one of the things that I did was I worked for a company called Computer Associates, which I've got to the point now where that one's actually dropped off the bottom of the resume. I kind of helped it. <laughs> I sort of shoved it off the bottom of the resume. And I wrote all their Windows 2000 courseware right around that time frame there. That's why I shoved it off the resume. Um, but I immediately after that got a job with a company called Zare, and they were a Linux certification company. 
And that was my first experience with a Linux certification, right? I knew LPI was out there, I knew Red Hat was out there. Uh, neither one of them answered calls, but the people at Zare answered a call, and the next thing I knew, I got an interview and I started working for them. They were based out of Oxford, Mississippi. The Oxford, Mississippi town motto, unofficial, but still official, is we may, never, we may not win all the football games, but we'll never lose a party. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm good with it. I can deal with that. Um, the history of this is important because CompTIA initially came up with the Linux Plus. It was a very long exam. It was like 250, 200, 250 questions, something like that. It was about three and a half hours. It was expensive, $300. Of course, it's a little more expensive even now. And then it, it was, okay, I'm going to be... I'm going to be frank but kind, <coughs> okay? I'm going to call it a Linux exam and objectives that was written by people who were quite fond of Windows. <laughs> it was not a true Linux exam. It was an attempt at a Linux set of objectives and an exam, and it's <coughs> success, in, success in the market was commensurate with that. Uh, I was one of the beta testers, early beta testers, and I, I liked what I saw. I thought it had potential in the same way that a band might have potential, but they're definitely not going to make it to the big time. Okay? You're going to be on the club circuit for quite some time, and then maybe someday you'll make it to the arenas. Well, it never survived the club circuit. It went round and round for a while. It was very expensive for them to, do, to uh, develop and maintain. And at a certain point, they said, you know what? I think what we're going to do is we're going to talk to the people over at LPI and see if we can't do a white label of the LPI level 1, 101 and 102. And certainly, and that's what happened. I happened to work at the Novell Corporation as a sales engineer, working mostly in data center. And the, around this time frame, um, we knew the guys at LPI very well, guys and gals at LPI. And so what happened was they white labeled the LPI certifications and they became the new CompTIA Linux Plus. Well, fast forward, uh, they've, the LPI and CompTIA have had just a bit of a messy end of that relationship. Um, they're just, there was a lot of revenue going back and forth and CompTIA decided that they might want to go and do another version of Linux Plus because of, you know it's needed in the industry, uh, they feel. And now everybody else in the industry, which is, so I, I leave out Red Hat and SUSE, because they have their own certification platforms and, and, and their goals and everything else. SUSE is not really centered on the uh, external candidate these days. It's mostly, mostly partners and employees and things like that. Red Hat has their own market. If you talk about vendor neutral certifications, I call uh, Linux Plus vendor neutralish certification because there's not really any vendors involved in it, but you have to install something, right? So because you have to install something, you might as well install an RPM and a, and a Debian and let it go with that. So 2010, we did the white label. It became the two exams at 170, which pushed it to uh, quite a bit more expensive. And now it's been, re it's about to be released, or is it, I think it, it's finally been released. Um, the book will be out soon, and it's a 90 question exam for 319. So you can see the kind of wavering back and forth that's happened here. It, <laughs> This era of the LPI exams being the Linux Plus exams was simultaneously a fairly good thing, but it was also really difficult to explain to people. What do you mean these two vendors have the same exams? How's that work? So we spent a lot of time in the, in the booth trying to explain to people what had happened. And now, guess what? We now have to unexplain the whole thing. It's like, okay, so when did you start in the world of Linux? And, and Okay, so I don't have to go to this one. I just have to go to this one in order to, But if you go all the way back to this one, you just say, it's the same, only better. And slightly more expensive. Okay. So this is the wonderful world of, of certifications and how they work. So why does it exist now? Well, the main thing is, if you have to look at it from CompTIA's point of view, they have a growing uh, presence in the, in the market. Linux has kind of got to the ubiquitous area of like it's pretty much everywhere. And so it's considered to be an entry point for a lot of people for different jobs. Uh, CompTIA has a very large government and uh, some education market. And so there's a lot of things that they want to do that they can't do if, they're, if they depend on somebody else. So there's some of that going on. They felt they were losing revenue with the LPI deal. 
uh, in that they were paying approximately half of the cost of, the, of each certification to LPI as a revenue share. Okay, well, it wasn't like LPI wasn't doing anything for that. <laughs> they were doing everything except for the selling. So, without getting into the politics of it, and there are plenty, they decided they were going to do this. Now, CompTIA does have a lot of leverage, they have a lot of partnerships, and they have a big sales channel. And so they feel that they can get Linux Plus, you know, better penetration in the market. Um, and honestly, I, I would say competition is good. Now, where it becomes confusing and it's not quite as friendly to the customer, the attendee, the exam taker, the, the candidate, as we like to call people, is now you have to look at it and go, I've got the Linux Foundation, and I've got Red Hat, and I've got Suits. I've got these five different choices. Okay, I'm leaving uh, Benchmark or whatever it was off of there, Test Bench or whoever they were. <laughs> you know what I mean? Brain, no, Brain Bench? Anyway, whoever it was. There was one that you would walk into somewhere to take a job and they'd say, well, in order to do this, we need to do a means test. Please come over here and take this 60 question online test that when you got it, it didn't mean anything, okay? It was just kind of like, let's weed out the people that don't know anything about Linux. Um, the other thing is, is this competition that's there means that the organizations that are competing are competing not just with each other, but they're competing for you which means they might drop prices a little bit, or they might do some deals, and they might do some bundles, or they might go out and do exam prep and things like that. So it actually becomes a little bit better for the attendees, the candidates that are in the market, aside from the fact that it can be confusing. So I'd like to help you as much as possible and answer your questions about which one of these is going to help you the most. I happen to be doing this because it happens to be new and just coming out. Okay? But I have plenty of information about the others as necessary. So here's CompTIA's page. Um, in order to get the objectives, you'll have to go and you know click on the exam details, fill out a little form, and they'll give you the exam objectives, and they'll also give you, I think it's two 30-question uh, sample question banks or two 60-question sample banks. Save those. Okay, they're, they're, It's a good way to look and see what's going to actually be, and I'll show you some of that as well. Okay, um, Took me a while, and I had to talk to a friend. I'm like, Where's the objectives? And they're like, it's that big form that's on the right. And I'm like, could you add something there that says, if you fill this out, we'll get the objectives? Long silence. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> they just send you to the page. And I just I went up and down and up and down. And I'm like, gosh, I like to think I can read web pages and stuff like that. So, But, you know, that's why you're going to want to get trainers involved, right? We can help point out where you can do better. Right? All right. So what's new? Remember now that CompTIA has rewritten this, it's not even remotely based on the LPIC-1. However, being a system administrator across the industry has some high degree of similarity. And so it, it, no matter where you come from on the spectrum of an organization, now admittedly, SUSE and Red Hat especially come at this from the standpoint of we've got a new distribution and you're going to learn all the great new stuff in this distribution along with the other stuff. And I, I freely admit that. I think it's a great thing. If, if that's what a vendor wants to do, that's no problem. However, the independent standards bodies, the ones that are vendor and distribution neutral, or in the case of some of them, multi-vendor neutral, then well, you know, Linux Foundation is a good one, right? They do three distributions, or two in some cases, right? So, but they, they do both sides, so Debian and, and uh, RPM. So when you look at it, you have to think to yourself, what commonalities are there amongst the certifications, and which one of these certifications represents the job that I think I want to go get? And, even more important, which one of these certifications is asked for or given credit in the applications that I'm going and filling out? Okay? So, I think these days it's probably a really good idea to have a Linux certification. Not just for the fact that it's a great way for you to kind of organize your knowledge and learn things that you might not learn otherwise, but it's also a great way for you to show that you have put some time and some energy and some application of effort into this thing, and you're serious. I always say to people, if you would like me to take you seriously, as far as being a candidate for you know uh, the open source workforce, as I like to call it, then when I look at your when I look at your LinkedIn profile, your Twitter stream, or your um, your Facebook page which I will as a hiring manager, don't kid yourself, if I see you uh, your last year in school with a tie around your head and a pint in your hand, 
I'm a little less likely to take you seriously as a Linux and open source professional than if I see you in a volunteer shirt out here at Linux Fest Northwest or working as an organizer or in the booth somewhere at another show or handing out DVD somewhere or doing an install fest or things like that. So that you, can, you can absolutely make a huge difference. And uh, one of the guys goes, oh, so that means when I start putting my resume around, all I have to do is, is fill my feed with pictures like that. I said, yeah, that's great, except for the whole scrolling thing. <laughs> I'm not just gonna look at the latest pictures that go up. But it, it is a, you know, it's a, it's a good strategy, right? Because then you're saying, look, take me seriously because I take being in this world seriously, right? So remember that the organizations still have a lot to do with each other. If you were to take an overlay of the different domains and what's covered in the objectives, you'll find that they may be in different places, but there's a great deal of similarity. 75 to 80% of all the certifications have commonality with the other certifications. Okay. Just got to figure out which one you think is going to be the most reasonable one. Okay. This contains some interesting things. I will talk to you about those interesting things. What's the difference between the uh, previous set of exams and the current ones? Well, it used to be two 60-question exams of 90 minutes. Gives you about a minute and a half for each one of the exam questions. Okay. Now, it's a 90-question exam in 90 minutes. Brisk, I like to call that. That means don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out whatever it is you know, if you're looking at the question and you have no idea and you don't think you're going to have an idea, yes. Because I guarantee you if you don't answer the question, it's wrong. If you answer the question, you have a one in four or one in five chance of possibly getting it right. Okay? And the odds are you may not get too many of those right, but also the fact that if you hit the exam and you have anywhere between six and ten questions that you have absolutely no idea for, I am going to make a prediction to you that you may not have prepared quite as vigorously as you ought to have. Okay? I'll show you the domains here in a moment and the percentages for the different domains so you know what to pay attention to. So if you see a huge set of stuff in one domain and it's 18% of the exam, probably not going to spend as much time in that domain. If one of them is 22% or 30% or whatever, and it's, you know, it, it, you're going to spend a lot more time in that. The percentage of the exam means how many questions of the 90 will appear. So what you do is you break it into a pie, and each of the four domains has a percentage. That's roughly how many of the 90 questions. I looked at that, and I'm like, oh, crap, I'm going to have to get a calculator for that one. I can't, quite, I can't quite do that percentage conversion decimal thing, whatever. My daughter comes over and goes, oh, it's, it's like, next time you tell me you're not good at math, shut up. Okay. She knows it's I'm not good at between 22 it. and 23. What's that? It's between 22 and 23. Well, they're not evenly split. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. That would have been easy <laughs> for me. Okay. So remember they used to be just static questions. Static questions means that there were no simulations. Now we have simulation questions. There is a particular thing that you will want to know about these simulation questions I will be happy to share with you because it just irritated the hell out of me until I figured it out. I don't tell you anything about it, but you can basically work your way through the entire simulation question by typing help and whatever you think comes next. And they designed it that way. I'm like, okay, that's good to know. That'll be fun the next presentation I give. Okay, any questions about what we covered so far? Ready to look at some of these objectives? Well, good, that's because we got next. All right, so this is the exam XKO004. The previous one was XK1 something or other, whatever. <laughs> I don't know what the numbering scheme means. But <laughs> you can always recognize CompTIA exam objectives by the way they look. Test details, number of questions, multiple choice, and some performance based That's CompTIA speak for simulation questions. Okay. I don't like simulation questions that much. I like actual hands-on exams. And I developed a lot of hands-on exams, especially at SUSE. Um, but I can see how they, you know, it, it's hard to distribute hands-on exams to, uh, you know, very far-flung locations where there's not a lot of bandwidth or there's not a test proctoring center and things like that. So question-based exams that you work hard to make them as performance-based as you possibly can, like fill-in-the-blank questions or simulations, Okay, that's reasonable. Recommended experience, 9 to 12 months, and the passing score is a 720. 
A lot of people look at that and go, wow, that's really high. Not much. Okay? Not too bad. What's a 720? Oh, where's my math guy? What's a 720 out of a, a scale of 900? Can't do that one in my head. Uh oh. He's got the calculator watch. Go ahead. But isn't it really more fair to say 620 out of 800 since your minimum score is not zero? No. Because there's really only 800 points above the minimum that you're going for? I think you get 100 points for starting the exam. <laughs> I don't know. I can't, so I can't figure that out. Putting your name on the side. That's right, yeah. Well, your name's actually already there, so you just kind of get granted that, okay? You know, I don't know why they do this, but LPI used to do it. Was that? 80%. Yeah, and I think 80% is actually a little high. I got performance based exams, you know, hands on exams, you only have to get a 65% to pass it, okay? So 80% is fairly high. I recommend that you study vigorously, okay? Let's take a look at the percentages here. So if you look at it, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, we've got 21, 26, 19, 20%, and 14%. And I just realized that my slide at the beginning of this left off number 5. Where's my little men in black flashy? <laughs> it's on there. Yeah. Okay, so there's the percentages. What this means is I would pay a high degree of attention to this one. Why? because it's over 25% of the exam. Next to that, I would pay a, a lot of attention to those two. Okay, do you think security is, if you don't do security all the time, do you think it's gonna have a bunch of stuff in there you've never heard of or haven't worked with? I do security all the time. It's got a lot of stuff in there that I don't work with. But that's part of the whole thing about studying for a certification or for an exam. It's to broaden you, okay? It's to make sure that your skill set is wider rather than just a bunch of silos. I can't tell you how many times I'd be in the booth and somebody come up to me and go, I don't think the exam covers the stuff that real sysadmins do. I'm like, I'm listening. <laughs> go for it. Well, I, because I never do this and I never do that. I'm like, okay, well, you've got your own set of silos. And I, the next guy who walks up or the next guy who walks up is going to tell me this doesn't cover the stuff that I want. And it's going to have 50% underlap with what you're talking about. Right? And so I always ask people, do you think for the rest of however long you will have in this world of technology as a career that you're only going to work in these six or seven or nine silos? Do you think you'll ever have a situation where you'll work in other things? Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Well, let's study for it. Yes? One of the things that I've discovered doing stuff that's similar is uh, there are things that I didn't know that I didn't know. So when I opened up the book and started reading about it, on oh, I didn't know that that was a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it was applicable to what I was doing. I, I always tell people, it's like, one of the things that I like about this is it shows me where I can go if I just simply go from one company to another, or one job role to another. I can switch over 50, 60, 70% of what I do on a consistent daily basis by just simply switching a company or switching a job role. And I think it makes us better. And also, I have seen people who have studied and got their certifications and kept up with the various areas. And then when a project comes up or somebody, somebody has a great idea and let's start such and such and so and so, they'll look around internally and say, well, who's got certifications or who's got experience with this? Me. And they get projects. So they will bona fide actually get you projects or get you jobs or whatever. Now, I'm always very careful about telling people this will get you a better job. I don't want to tell you that you should get your certification and then jump ship, okay? Enough of you probably will if you get a, a job offer. But um, what was the, what was the uh, Bloom County many years ago? It said money can't buy you love, but it sure improves your bargaining position, okay? Certifications are no guarantee of a great job, but it definitely improves your chances of getting the interview in which you can impress them with your sterling capabilities, okay? So there we go. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to predict to you, when you look at these, if you were to map these, and we have against the LPI and the Linux Foundation certifications, that there's, like I said, about 80, 85% overlap between them. And some of the stuff is just, you know, doesn't really matter. All right. Well, let's take a look at hardware and system configuration. I'm going to pick a few things out here. What I'm going to do is tell you the things that I have seen people miss the most. Now, if you would like <clears throat> a copy of the slides, I'll give you my email at the end. Uh, I just have broken this down and done a bunch of screenshots and everything else. It wasn't, wasn't anything that I needed to go in and copy all this out of here and reformat it and act like I wrote it. 
Okay, it's just the objectives, but let's talk about it because having seen a great deal of people take uh, boot camps that I was teaching and also certifications that I've written and scored, et cetera. So at SUSE, um, on a consistent yearly basis, we would have people come to SUSEcon and do anywhere from 300 to 600 certifications in a four day span. That's a lot of people, that's a lot of really good feedback, because people don't come walking out of there and go, well, that was relaxing. <laughs> they come out and go, damn, I hate that question about so-and-so. And they're -so. <laughs> like, okay. You know, or here, just fill out the after action report and let me know what you thought about it. So I wanna, let, me, let me work with you on these things. When you look at the bootloader stuff, how many of you deal with bootloaders all the time anymore? Precisely. Okay. <laughs> Why would you deal with a bootloader? Because you're not installing stuff anymore. Usually you're doing some sort of automated install, a playbook of some kind or something like that, YAML files, whatever. Or you're just simply using images that already have all this stuff burned into it, right? So you'll have to spend a little bit of time on the bootloaders and the boot options just to make sure that you understand what might be asked about that. Now, the way to study these things is to go and find somewhere that someone has written about these and just simply read about the differences between Grub and Grub2. Grub2 being the latest one, okay? What are some of the differences? If you don't know the differences, then I absolutely guarantee you, you'll have a question on the exam about that. Exams, babies, salespeople, and wolves can all sense fear. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> Bonus points for anybody who got the Van, Van Wilder reference. Okay, I had somebody the other day go, what is this Van Wilder you speak of? <laughs> I said, well, go look it up on IMDB. You're welcome. Make sure you watch the last one, too. Okay, so file locations. Why would it be important for me to know the file locations? Because the dang things change between versions. That's very important. I'm going to go in and configure this. I can't find the files. Why? Because it's a different version. Okay, that makes sense. Boot modules and all this. You do need to understand the role of Draken and also, like, the concept of an initial RAM disk, the concept of the initial RAM file system, you need to understand how it is that I can have a system that has specialty hardware on it and it needs to have access to the drivers that allow me to access the specialty hardware, but I'm booting from the hardware that I need the specialty access to. Can you see how this might be a little confusing? Okay, that's exactly why you need to understand what's going on here, okay? Initial RAM FS, the EFI files, and then what's the version between the two? Uh, why, why do we have VM Linux and VM Linux? And it's, it's confusing. You're going to find some discussion about, let me have your own one of these, uh, some discussion about uh, that it's not, it's a compression or not compression. There's a reason why a Z and a reason why an X, okay? Has to do with the size of the kernel. One of them is designed to fit a certain way. The other one is designed to fit another way. All right? So then let's take a look down here. Oh, um, the other thing is, I, this really threw me. I've written a large number of objectives. I've studied an exponentially larger number of objectives. Never have I had an objective start with given a scenario and then a bunch of stuff. So the first thing I said, basically I filed a bug report when I first got it. I'm like, okay, so are these the working notes? And then you're gonna have like the real descriptions? And they said, no, this is what we're gonna do. Huh, okay, that's interesting. All right, I'm good with that. So given a scenario, what's a scenario? What are they trying to evoke here? They're not just testing you on an individual command. They're not just saying, give me the options for this command. They're saying, in the question, we're gonna set up a little scenario that has some context to it, and then we're gonna ask you a question about some aspect of that scenario. Now, what's a really good tip to take away from that? What should you do with the question? Make sure you get all the information mined out of it. I love it when people come down and they say, well, that was a pretty, pretty simple thing, and I'm like, well, no, it wasn't, because you didn't pass. Like, wait a minute, why? Because, uh, you know, and then I say, tell me a couple of questions that you're going to tell me. I say, oh, did you remember the such and such and so and so? Because they mentioned that in there. It happened to be right before the comma. Long silence, no. Nope. Okay. Question writers on Linux side do not put big fluffy questions 
in there. They're a fairly tight code. They're fairly straightforward. If it's in there, it's important. And it can make all the difference between which one of the answers you will choose. And thankfully in this one, they don't do a lot of stuff of what's the best way to do so-and-so. You mean what's the most subjectively arguable way to do something? They say, uh, you know, which is the most efficient regarding so-and-so kind of thing. So they've actually done a good job writing these, the questions themselves. So if you look at it, we've got our, you know, all of our, uh, you know, mod probe. You need to understand mod probe, the modules depth file. You need to understand um, LS mod, ints mod, um, RM mod, D message. Um, there's some other things around D message. I can't remember what it is. There's something with D message. Make sure you look at that pretty closely. Understanding modules, okay? What modules are, how they're loaded, how they're loaded in groups with dependencies, which would be mod probe, okay? And how they're unloaded. And what's their relationship to each other? So you will have to parse LS mod output and determine which of the modules is loaded and which dependencies are, and, and what dependencies it has, okay? So make sure that you run LS mod a number of times and look at things and make sure that you understand that the module is on the left side and there is a relationship between the module on the left side and the things that appear on the right side. Now, I'm not going to spoil it. I want you to make sure that you understand clearly what the relationship of those things on the right side are. If there's nothing there, there's no dependencies. Okay? All right, let's take a look at the network connection parameters. This is a huge one. All the diagnostic tools. You think you're going to get asked about all those diagnostic tools? I mean, we've got 90 questions, but dang. Okay? You're probably going to get asked about things like dig. Um, I love this is another one of those ones. Okay, NS Lookup. How many years has NS Lookup been telling us that it's been deprecated? <laughs> Ten or more? Which is sad because I love NS Lookup. That's okay. I used to love teaching TCPIP too, but then we don't do that anymore. Um, host, route, well, so you can group these things together, right? If you've never heard of it before, a lot of people haven't heard of the SS command, <laughs> NMCLI, BRCTL, NM2E. You've never read about these, never heard of these? First thing you want to do is run the man page on them and take a look at them. That doesn't always do it for me. I kind of need to go out and you know do some lookups and see, try to find some examples, things like that. I'll give you a tip. If you're looking for the examples in a man page, the easiest way to find the examples in the man page, let's see if I can pull up a shell real quick here. Probably not. Fine. my comedy. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Let's get a shell. Let's see. What's a good one? The IP command. Maybe this will show us. So searching inside the... Apparently not anymore. That was interesting. I thought I was showing it. There we go. All right. So a forward slash inside the man page that says search. Search forward. And so I have to look at this. Uh, if I'm looking for something like examples, examples begins at the very first character, the first uh, uh, column, and it's in uppercase. Of course, it's not found. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, let's see. Damn it. Uh, said. There we go. Uh, I suck. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the headers, the section headers inside of man pages are in all caps and they start at the first, uh, first column. So it's very easy to search for the examples in a man page by just simply, you know, forward slash, caret symbol, shift six, and then in uppercase what you're looking for. A lot of the pages, except for the ones I just tried to show you, have the examples in there. Question? Oh, no, you meant it. Okay. All right. Yes. Just do a man on man um, examples. What's that? Man, man, man. Man, 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 man examples. Man, man. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, man. Screw that up? Yes, I did. Your pattern actually doesn't work. Your 
Thanks. And it is indeed the Apple version, and so there are no examples on it. How cute. All right, then. Well, now that I've impressed you with the, uh, <laughs> my demo skills, <laughs> uh, I will talk a little bit about your study environment here in just a minute. Okay, so here's this, this set here. I would highly uh, concentrate on anything that you're going to type as far as setting or altering IP addressing, routing, or gateways. Okay, that's a typical thing that you're going to see. I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on the stuff like down here, but you definitely spend uh, time on stuff up here. Netstat is a favorite. Whoever it is that writes the exam questions loves Netstat. So understand what Netstat minus N is, understand how to determine, uh, how to show IP addresses without names, how to show names, you know, port numbers, things like that. Okay. The other thing here is this, the, the bonding and load balancing stuff. This is kind of a, do you understand the concept of this? Not a, can you do this you know, with these commands? It's, can you answer a question about what this might be? We're going to give you a scenario that says, um, they're, they're doing such and such and so and so. Uh, which of the following do best describes what is being taken place here? What is taking place, being done here? Anyway. Um, also, you need to understand the relationships between three main files. Your host file, your nsswitch.com file, and your resolve.com file. So I'm going to draw a little thing here that can be helpful to you. And that is, if you look at it, you, let's see. I wonder if I have that graphic somewhere. Now, uh, so the relationship between them is that when it comes time to resolve names, where do you go first? The nsswitch.com file. In the nsswitch.com file is a line that says hosts. And hosts tells you in what order you go and look at things. Files, uh, you know, the DNS, uh, you know, whatever, NIS plus, thing like that, right? What order do you actually go look at? If it says to go look at files first, what's the file that it goes to in order to try to resolve names? The Etsy host file. If it's misconfigured, in other words, it's resolved, but it's inaccurate in the Etsy host file, does it fail over to DNS? If you don't know the answer to that, go find out. The answer is no, it does not. If it's inaccurately resolved, it just stops. If it's not resolved, it will go to the next one. So it's kind of a, is it an or or a not? If this is successful, then don't. If not successful, then do. Okay, so it's an if, then, do, help, whatever. You get the idea, okay? But those three files, and in the resolve.com file is what? The IP addresses for your DNS servers. Yes? Could you repeat the three again? It was host, never, uh, host resolve. So it looks at nsswitch.com to see where to go next. Goes next to either Etsy hosts or to the resolve.com. Okay, and I will, um, after this, I will try to find that graphic and I'll drop it in the slides at the appropriate point so you can see it. I just, I've, I've done this before. One of those things where if I drew something three times in a row during classes, I would just turn it into a slide, right? Why not? Okay, all right, so let's keep going because now my goal isn't to show you each and every one of these because there's a lot of them, but to give you some of the tough ones. Now, you're gonna absolutely have to understand the different package types, what are in the package types, and why they're important, okay? You're gonna have to understand yum and zipper. At the very least, you have to understand the, RP, uh, the um, apt, you have to understand how to, how to install software on both sides, you have to understand how to query certain things out of packages, Something that may be helpful to you, because this could mean the difference on at least two questions of passing and failing on those questions, is you need to know the difference between querying information from an installed package versus a package on disk. And in RPM, that difference is minus P followed by the package name. Right, so if, you say, if it says a, a query a package in the so-and-so directory for an info page, Whatever you choose had better have minus P 
in the command or you're not querying a package that's on disk, you're querying a installed package from the database. That's very important. Okay, that distinction alone can, uh, can cause a lot of problems. Another thing that's here, uh, compiling, you know, what are shared libraries, you have to understand what repositories are, configuring a repository, that kind of thing. All right, so, you know, it's not, I mean, it's traditional stuff. You need to understand, make, make, install, uh, what uh, the relationship um, between the different files, the etsy.ld.so.conf file, <laughs> I think. Um, LDD, you'll need to study LDD. So this shows you the libraries that are in use or linked to or the shared libraries that are being used by a command. So run LDD against slash bin slash ls and look at what comes back. Also, you need to understand how the libraries, the shared libraries, are configured on the system. And it's not on there. But it is on the exam because it occurs in that section. Okay, so managing users and groups. Uh, you would think that managing users and groups would be fairly straightforward. It is fairly straightforward. However, for whatever reason, they decided to put quotas back in there. <sighs> I hate quotas. Quotas are hard to, hard to configure. Hard and soft quotas. You know, I'm like, come on, can't we all just buy more disk? You know, when's the last time you set up quotas for something outside of an educational environment? Okay, I can remember on two separate occasions actually buying larger disk drives surreptitiously for clients who couldn't afford disk because we're like, we're not going to install quotas. Just go get a drive. You know, it was okay. <laughs> we expensed it. <laughs> Anyway, profiles, what are your profiles? What are the files that affect you and your profile and you're signing in? Do you know the difference between assigning something on a global level and assigning something for an individual user? Where do you assign things for an individual user for their environment? Home directory. Home directory in a, some kind of a file that starts with a dot. Could be the dot profile file, could be the dot bash. Mesh RC file. Are there any others? What's the one that gets uh, uh, executed or sourced when you log out? Bash underscore logout file. That's the one that has the clear command in it that gets all your stuff off the screen so people can't read your buffer. I have not seen a question on that one, but it's definitely possible. Also understand what the lines are and what appears in what order, in what fields in the Etsy pass WD and the Etsy group files. Thank God they don't ask you about the Etsy shadow fields because I can't remember those and I see it every day. You know what I mean? Those are brutal. Okay, how important do you think this section is? Very. Text processing is always a big deal. Why? Because every single thing on the entire system is a file. Everything. Boy, there's another one of those, it's a hot dog or sandwich arguments, right? You've, you've seen those, right? Yeah, we, we had like 3,000 messages at work on that one. It's a hot dog or sandwich. Like, oh. So right as it died down, I said, is a wrap a sandwich? Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> it's a hot dog or taco. <laughs> there's, a, there's a cubosity rule of like, you know, how, how many sides uh, does an eatable substance surround another eatable substance that it's like, you know. Anyway, so take a look at these because if you don't know, I, I love the text editors, Nano and VI. <laughs> okay. Well, they left out Emacs. Okay. They left out the ed command. They left out X, EX. Okay. Um, that, that's not the only uh, text editors in this world. Uh, but you will be asked questions about uh, about editing, probably opening files, closing files, and saving, uh, I'm sorry, and exiting VI without saving the buffer. That's an important one to know. And the answer is not reboot, okay? <laughs> or kill the VI instance, right? Output and input redirection. Do you understand what to redirect ampersand one means? I mean, what that means? Sort of. <laughs> You're redirecting standard error to standard out. Yes. So <clears throat> in this world, you almost never see 
one redirect and then something because one standard out is considered to be so common that you redirect didn't you don't even bother I'm gonna cough <coughs> however if you want to send standard error stream number two to the same exact location like you want to send everything off to dev null then two redirect ampersand one does that followed by slash dev slash null you know what dev null is right that's the black hole, the bit bucket that just discard it, don't show it on the screen. Okay? All right. Text processing wise, you're going to see quite a bit of stuff. Pay attention to XRGs and T and this thing. Here documents. Anybody ever heard of a here document? It's what? a double uh, left uh, carrot, then a uh, word, then text, and it's terminated by the word. Yep. It's basically a double left. Input redirect, which you could do with a single redirect, but not quite the same way. I looked at this and I'm like, okay, I've never heard it called this. This has added something to my little skill set. Have I used it? No. Um, but at least I know about it, okay? And also, then you've got all your file and directory operations over here. You understand the difference between hard and soft links? You understand hard and soft link? Hard link can only occur within the same IO table or file system. Soft links, sim links were designed to go from one file system to another. Hard links share the same inode. If you need to find the multiple files that all share the same inode, use find minus inum, I-N-U-M, and it will go out and search everything and come back and show you the files. Okay? A symbolic link has separate inodes for the link and the file that it's linked to. Okay? All right. So, important stuff. Things that trip people up quite a bit. Okay, managing services. Uh, if you're not already up to speed on System D, you'll need to be. Definitely understand System D. Got a little SysV in here, not not as much as there was before. But if you if you need, you need to understand the differences between System Five and System D. Okay. Now, most of us who grew up on System Five viewed System D as being you know the next thing to the apocalypse. But they really did a good job when they wrote System D. I have to give them props because they, they, they thought, you know, we're going to be asking a lot of people who love a particular style. Well, not love, but respect, uh, admire maybe. Uh, well, maybe not. Anyway, people who use System 5 to switch over to this new thing that we're doing. Okay? Best analogy I ever came up with this was System 5 is like putting the needle on the groove and it just keeps going around until everything is loaded, okay? System D is like dropping a box of rabbits in a room and eventually everything orders out, right? It's like the, when you start System D, everything starts all at once, right? System five, it's an orderly process. System D is like, hey, guess what? The whole system is mine. <coughs> Nobody's doing anything because it's the boot process. They can't do anything but watch me boot. So, use all available processes all at once. Go for it, fast as you can. That's also kind of how Upstart worked as well, okay? Which is no longer around, really. Okay, let's see the last piece over here, the service command, you need to understand that. You also need to understand the analysis uh, stuff over here, directory locations, unit files, targets, everything about system D. Go read some articles about system D, it'll help you a lot. There's a lot of people who cathartically wrote about how much they hated system D in a certain time frame. Me too. Okay, never liked it that much. Got used to it. Uh, server roles, <laughs> this, this is like the puffiest, cloudiest, woo -hoo, nothing there. This one, I looked at it, I didn't get asked a single question. I think I got asked, uh, you're doing such and such and so and so, what, what, what best defines the role of this server? It's file server, okay? One question, all right? But I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on that. Do you understand the jobs command? Do you understand uh, background, foreground? Do you understand how to kill jobs, process control, things like that? Very important stuff. Um, what's the difference between the cron and at commands? Anybody? At is like a one-time schedule in the future. Mm -hmm. be at time do such. And cron says every whatever. Yeah, so it's one time versus multiple times. And you can do weird things like schedule at jobs to remind you to do cron jobs and weird crap like that. But, okay. So, you know, if, if somebody has thought of it, yeah, 
Right. So, uh, use and operation of devices. So there's a lot of stuff in here, and I didn't see a whole lot on the, on the, the two beta exams that I took, but you do need to understand enough about devices in order to be able to set up new devices, format devices. You need to understand what goes where and why, right? So you've got a disk, and on that disk there are partitions. If I gave you a partition number of SDA7, what can you automatically tell me about SDA7? It's a SCSI disk drive. Well, it's, it, no, not necessarily, but it might be a USB with multiples on it. But what's the seven? What's important about that seven? Partition. It's a logical partition. Because logical partitions start at five and go up. Everything else is four and below. Okay? So if you can identify that, you're doing pretty good. Let me jump real quick to my, uh, my section about being super helpful here. There we go. Exam prep. Question types, simple, multiple choice, choose two, choose three, choose all, apply. The simulation, got to get this one to you. You'll get a simulation command, and if you get the one about NTP, then you know what the deal is, okay? Uh, I'm under NDA, but everybody knows about that one because somebody wrote about it on the web. Um, the simulation question, you'll be presented with an interface, told what to do, go ahead and start the, 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 the environment, and then it just pops up, and it's all written in Flash or whatever, and you work your way through whatever it is. Okay. I don't want to talk bad about a question, but they just gave it away. All you have to do is type help, and it'll tell you what commands you can type next. If I don't even know the commands, I just type help. They tell you, type help. <laughs> it, I didn't notice that at first. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. So I sat there and I tried all the stuff that I know. I'm like, damn, I know how to do this. It's not working. And I canceled back out of it, went back and looked at it, and it said, if you need help, type help. Oh, shit, OK. <laughs> It's right there in the question. All right, in the instructions. Type help. Here's three commands. I'll type one of the commands. I know this command will work. I typed help, so and so the command. Came back and it gave me the options that I could type next. I'm like, let's see how far this goes. All the way, baby. All the way through. It tells you exactly what you need to know. Step, 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 step. You just need to know what commands to start off with. Keep typing help. Are they going to change it? I don't know. But it certainly works that way now. So if you don't know, you can walk your way through it. I like that. Study strategies. Two VMs, one with a Debian-based distribution, one with an RPM-based distribution. Doesn't matter what they are. I just threw a couple up there. Ubuntu latest, you know, CentOS latest, whatever. <clears throat> Take a snapshot, system state, right as you start. So install them, snapshot them. Every time you go in and do something, take a snapshot. Why? It takes very little disk space, but now you, if you FUBAR it, and I, I will present to you my theory very shortly of how to get good at something. Screw shit up until you stop screwing shit up, okay? Just keep going. Keep blowing stuff up until all of a sudden there's no other path other than the one that's left. Guess what? That's the one that works, okay? Now, I've seen people say, well, oh, no, you, you, know, you shouldn't do that. I'm like, you know, there's a lot of failure in this. <laughs> yeah. There's an old saying that experience is proportional to the amount of equipment you've destroyed. Yes, yes, that's also also very appropriate. Uh, or, or the amount of uh, snapshots you've taken and had to roll back. <laughs> so let's update that one, right? Okay, so a couple of other real important pieces here as far as the study stuff goes. Make sure that you set aside time to study. Yes, I have kids. I know how hard it is. Okay, I have a rule that if the radio on air light above dad's door is on, enter at risk of your life or your emotional being. Okay, do not. I, and the wife and the child and everybody else text me, and if I don't answer, I don't give a damn if it's lunch or not. I'm in the middle of something, I'll wander out sooner or later, hypoglycemic and ready to eat. Okay, just put mine in the oven, I'll be there soon. I'm writing, okay, if you don't understand. If you tell somebody, not to disturb you because you're writing and they have kind of a confused look on their face and they're like, so what? You need to educate them as to what writing really means. It means groaning and travail as you try to get something out, okay? Giving birth from a literary standpoint, okay? Always mix your formats. I, I, my, my ear bones are a great place for me to get information in. I can only look at stuff so much. I can only read so much before I just get fatigued. I can only watch so many videos out of the corner of my eye, 
and I like to listen to a lot of technical podcasts. I like to also find audiobooks uh, and like O'Reilly's Network, Safari, and stuff like that. It's a great place to go find that stuff. So use all of the available input paths. Um, I won't call them orifices, but input paths that you have in order to be able to get this information in. And you'll be surprised how much you can absorb if you m modulate your inputs. Okay? All right. Oops, that was the next one. And that's it. So thank you for coming. I hope you got a little bit out of this. Um, if you need to A, get the slides, or B, would like to communicate with me, I am Ross at Brunson.org. I will be very, not O-R-Y, O-R-G. I will be happy to answer your questions. Um, I, a gratuitous plug right before you leave. There is a, the next version of the Pearson CERT guide for the Linux Plus exam, this exam, coming out as soon as I get Chapter 3 and Chapter 14 to the editor, <laughs> which I'm late. Uh, probably in the next month or so. So take a look for that on Amazon. The old version of the book is still available. It's still good. Um, if you want to, you can grab like an electronic copy of that one, but it covers both. Well, it covers the CompTIA and LPI version of the exam. It actually works for the LPI version of the exam right now. Uh, but the CompTIA Linux Plus one will be out in about a month. And in that, um, so the, all of us who work on it are trainers, so we actually train in the real world, and we take what we do in the classroom and put that in the book. So if you, if you like the style of presentation, some do, some don't, uh, it's like spending an entire book uh, with Ross in class, so, which, which is either horrifying or okay, one or the other. I'm fine with it either way. So thanks for coming. Thanks for lending your ears and your brain time. And we'll see you on the show floor. Okay?